that gender is also a very, very much a dimension of politics. So today we decided to talk about two very important ideologies, Islam and feminism. So this this course is intended to prove the very complicated idea of feminism and also its compatibility with Islam. And so it's, I mean, it's two very uh, talked about ideologies and, and lately there's been a lot of discussions on whether they can coexist or, or are they purely com conflicting ideologies. So we decided to invite two very smart, very intelligent, very young women uh, <laughs> to, to talk about uh, these issues and these two people have been very very vocal on uh, on this topic. So the first one is Zara Faris. Uh, she is a part of the Muslim Debate Initiative. Uh, she's, she has talked extensively about liberalism and feminism and she's also an alumnus of SOAS. Chair. <laughs> the next speaker is Datin Paduka Marina Mahade. She is a she's an advocate of feminism within an Islamic framework. She is also very active in humanitarian efforts such as HIV AIDS. And also she's a board member of the Sisters in Islam Foundation. Our moderator for today is the manager of gender in MPUK, uh, Izaki Baidro. Uh, she, she is the mastermind of this project. She, is, she has orchestrated and planned this project for, for many, many months. So I hope that today she has a lot of very interesting questions in store. Uh, before we go on to the discussion, uh, the format for today's event is 10 minutes introductory speech each, uh, followed by about 30 minutes or so for the moderator to pose her questions. Uh, after a five minute short break, there will be an extensive Q&A session where anybody can uh, come up and ask anything. <laughs> and there will be a post-event informal chat with the speakers, so if you like to talk personally to them, then you can stay back after the event. Okay? Uh, just like uh, technical things, um, the prayer room is right beside this hall. The, the bathroom is downstairs. And, and it would be really, really nice if everybody silent or mute their phone or just turn it off so it doesn't disturb the flow of the Alright. Thank you, uh, Nawal, for the warm introduction. Uh, I'm just not going to use the mic because it disturbs the uh, audio for our video recording. So uh, I'm just going to project my voice. Okay, thank you, Nawal, for the introduction, for the warm introduction. Uh, just to note, Nawal is also the manager of Sociology of MPK. We have that section on the MPK. Um, so if anyone wants to talk to her, please do so. Um, it has come to my attention that compatibility or conflicting ideas of Islam and feminism should be discussed in a, mat in a mature setting. <coughs> Islamic feminism, a phenomenon that deras derives internally with no obvious West or East fault line, appeared firstly in the countries where um, patriarchal uh, Islamism, Islamism is exercised widely. However, why do we need feminism if Islam is inherently self-correcting? Um, to what extent does Islam and feminism agree with each other? Um, this topic unbolted a lot, a plethora of questions um, that many of us in this room keem to know. Um, hence, without further ado, I would just allow Datin Paduka Marina Mahdi to give her introductory remark. Um, and then for the rest of the 
and not stigmatizing and discriminating against people living with HIV. And it was a very, you know, it was a long process of working with, with uh, all these religious leaders. Um, and, and for me, it was a very enlightening experience because my instinct that we had to bring in religious leaders was correct. Uh, we had to bring them in because they could, could do so much good. And what was enlightening for me is that, that we could, unlike those people that I met uh, at overseas conferences, religion could be a very positive force for the work that we did, right? So that was one. So, um, but uh, there was one specific problem though that wasn't quite settled by the way we were, and that was the problem with women who were vulnerable to HIV. Um, most, there were most women in Malaysia, I mean, if any of you remember that, in Malaysia, the HIV problem was mostly among drug users, who are mostly men, and who are mostly, uh, sadly, Malay and Muslim. So their wives and partners were at particular risk of infection through sexual transmission from, from them, right? So we found uh, uh, that there was a really very specific problem in uh, protecting these women from HIV or in reducing their vulnerability to HIV. And it, it was not just about uh, giving them information. Information you can give, you know, how do you get HIV, how do you not get HIV. But how do they act on it, right? What could, you know, what's the point of talking to them about condoms? Because very often the, the people they are most at risk at was their own husbands. And how do you bring up this question without really creating a huge problem and possibly putting yourself at risk of being beaten up? Yeah? And how do you talk to them about abstinence? You can't talk to them about abstinence, they're married. Right? So we had a lot of cases where these women would be running back to their mother saying, you know, I'm really afraid I might get infected. My husband, I know he's on drugs. Um, what do I do? And the mothers would say, no, you have to go back uh, because you have to obey your husband. You, you know, you can't say no to him. Now, I'm very sure uh, that these mothers, if they knew the risk and if they knew what HIV meant, uh, they would not so easily say that to their daughters. Uh, which just goes to show that you should educate everyone uh, about HIV regardless of their actual risk. Um, but this was a problem, this was a big problem for a lot of the women that we met. Uh, how, do you how do you protect them? So this was what, um, so you know, so I got to thinking like, what are these women do? Um, are these beliefs about uh, their relationship with their husbands, is that correct? Uh, or is there room to, to uh, maneuver with, with this. So, um, so just as, you know, when, when we work with Jackie to find like religious justifications for prevention, treatment, care, support, and all that, and doing that manual, where we found a lot of um, Quranic verses and things like that, I started to think like, okay, how can we protect these women from a religious point of view, like how do we counter uh, this? And that's really um, how I became a Muslim feminist. Because I believe that if um, these Muslim women were made vulnerable by what they believe uh, Islam said about how they should act with the husbands, then there was a problem. And, and, um, and I didn't believe that God would do that to women that just purposely make them unable to protect themselves. But that somehow didn't ring true to me because of what I believe about Islam. Um, so, um, so with the help of various Islamic scholars, uh, Prof. Hashim Kamali was one, uh, Prof. Fatih Osman was one, we started to think about um, uh, and reading various publications uh, including those published by my colleagues at CIS, 
I came to two conclusions. One was that the Quran is a wonderfully liberating book. Because if you read it, and you, you and for yourself particularly, um, it talks about, it emphasizes justice and equality over and over again. And so one of my favorite verses, it says that men and women are close of each other, which means we protect each other. So how does that gel with men, you know, not, uh, men not caring about infecting their wives, for instance? You know, how is that protection? Um, so that, that can't be right. So how can it be just if women were left to the mercy of infection from their own husbands? And if the Quran says that every man and woman is entitled to, has a right to bodily integrity, to dignity and all that, how can we, you know, just because of biology, just that they, women have to be left to be uh, infected? So, so this was one. Of course, men um, who are infected also uh, deserve treatment, care and support. I'm not arguing about that, but women very often uh, suffered more from the stigma. Um, just a brief thing, you know, very often women found they were infected through HIV tests when they are pregnant because we have a prevention of mother to child uh, treatment um, uh, program. And very often, you know, they are found to be pregnant, uh, found to be infected first. And very often it's because they, they were infected by the husband, but the husband had not been tested yet. So very often, um, they uh, were blamed for the infection. And we know lots of women will be thrown out of the families and everything uh, because, of, because they were tested first. So that, that was a big issue. And secondly, if to be a feminist is to care about women's issues, not just about HIV, but also about violence against women, and laws and policies that discriminate against women at work, at home, in the courts, then the, the solutions for me can be found in the Quran. So what is needed, however, is for women to reclaim the right to find the answers in the Quran by themselves and not through others, especially if the others are men. Because um, I, I really think that the Quran's principles and ethics are for all time. And we, we have to, and it can respond to every situation, but not literally. It came in a certain time, meant to respond to certain situations at a time, but the situation has changed. So the question is, how can we apply the Quranic principles of justice and equality to the situation of Muslim women today? And I think we can, and um, that's why I think Islam and feminism are completely compatible. So I think I'll stop there first and let Sarah have a say, then we can carry on. Because uh, I have a lot more to say about that. But that. That's just in brief the story of how I came to this position. Now we're going to proceed with Mar uh, sorry, Zara Harris uh, with the introduction. Okay, um, first of all, assalamu alaikum and greetings to everybody for coming and uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I begin in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Now the title of this evening is Islam and Feminism, Compatible or Conflicting? First of all, can everybody hear me at the back? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Now, the mere fact that some people decide to call themselves Muslim feminists is not really proof that Islam and feminism are compatible. And one of the greatest ironies, perhaps, is that such feminists regularly affirm, through their own work, that feminism and Islam are not compatible unless Islam changes to fit feminist ideas. Now, some feminist groups, like Sisters in Islam and Musawa, instead of reviving Islam, often you find them demanding reinterpretations, repudiations, or the reformation of Islam in order to actually align it with Western secular liberal beliefs. Now, for example, they openly advocate the cherry-picking of prophetic traditions that they like, i.e. hadith, and rejecting those they don't like. So, Kisha Ali, for example, some of you may have heard of her, she claims that Contemporary believers are permitted to adopt hadith when it agrees with contemporary Western ethics, but to reject it when it contradicts them. So there's this cherry-picking going on. 
Aisha Chowdhury, in um, one of Musawa's uh, publications, justifies rejecting hadith that they do not like by stating that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was a patriarchal man who belonged and was comfortable in 7th century Arabia. And she asks readers to take advantage of the pliable nature of prophetic reports. And when it comes to Quranic interpretations, some of you may have heard of uh, Amina Wudud and Asma Lam Rabit. They also outrageously argue that the Islamic injunction for a wife to obey her husband in what is halal, obviously not in that particular circumstances which you referred to, contradicts the oneness of God as they claim that obedience is for God alone. Now, if obedience to the husband is idolatry, then according to such feminists, a boy obeying his mother would also be idolatry. A citizen being a law-abiding person would also be idolatry. And a Muslim obeying the Prophet, peace be upon him, which the Quran specifically requires, would also be idolatry. Now, Amin Awadud, who is a founding member of Sisters in Islam, she went even further when she infamously said with regards to Quranic text, personally, I'm quoting, she says, personally, I've come to places where how the text says what it says is just plain inadequate or unacceptable, however much interpretation is, reenacted, is enacted upon it. And she says further that when she disagrees with the Quranic text, she says, there is the possibility of refuting the text to talk back to even say no. So does this sound like feminists themselves think that Islam and feminism are compatible? Doesn't really sound like it. Now they also claim, for example, that gender roles do not exist in Islam because of the principle of equality or musawa. Now interestingly, the Quran doesn't actually use the word musawa or any of its derived forms, except when it's saying not equal our belief and disbelief. This is the only instance in which you'll find that this term used. Rather, the Quran recognizes that no two people, regardless of gender, are given the same provisions, blessings, or tests. And in the afterlife, similarly, people are ranked and rewarded differently. So people are treated with and promised justice in the Quran, not a blanket equality. It's not proposing a kind of communism. But due to its somewhat shallow thinking and assessing the worth of individuals in materialistic terms, what feminism ends up doing is dehumanizing the very sophisticated Islamic injunctions in the Quran that relate to family and marriage. And whilst it advocates intersectionality in diagnosing problems, it fails to appreciate the interconnectedness and the checks and balances that actually exist within the Sharia itself. And its individualistic worldview means it fails to look beyond the individual and appreciate the foresight that the Sharia has in preventing certain injustices. Now this means that feminists who need to argue that Islam is male biased cannot really explain why in Islam a woman has a right over her husband's time, his money and even his body. And so they cannot therefore also accept, accept the Islamic rulings on inheritance, spousal obligations, rulings on family leadership, modesty, and so on. And by constantly demanding that Islam has to change, feminists are openly admitting that it is not compatible with Islam. So it's not me saying it, this is feminists saying it. But what exactly do they want Islam to change into? Now, feminists such as Asma Balas, Ziba Mir Husseini, and others openly write that they're trying to, and I quote, reconcile reconcile Islam with modernist conceptions of justice, feminist theories, Western conceptions of human rights, and contemporary Western ethics. In other words, they're not acting as interpreters of the text, but rather as secular liberal interpolators, in some ways missionaries. Now, instead of reviving classical Islamic understanding and inspiring creative liberators in the Muslim world, we see such feminists, unfortunately, trying to strip away the Islamic mechanics and safeguards for justice. And instead of helping Muslim society out from its post-colonial backwardness, which it is in and is facing a lot of problems because of, such feminists seem instead to be trying to complete the colonial project by pushing for the full imitation of Western ideologies. Now, this is not compatibility, brothers and sisters. This is a forced marriage and followed by a forced conversion. Now, Amin Awadud also talked about the frustrations that Muslim feminists feel when they have to pretend to argue 
feminism from an Islamic perspective and not a secular, uh, secular liberal perspective. So she writes in her book, the executive director of Sisters in Islam, Zaina Anwar, once asked, why can't we say we are working for gender justice from a human rights perspective instead of our earlier claim of working for a gender inclusive Islamic perspective? And Amr Wadud commented, quite honestly, I understand the frustrations. So in other words, feminists seem to want to bring Muslims towards secular liberalism in the same way that sometimes missionaries from other religions will use the Quran to try to bring Muslims to other religions. Now, where exactly do these secular liberal values lead us, if that's where, we're trying, if that's where they're trying to take us? So let's look at what they consider to be the utopia, their vision of, of what the West actually is. Now, in the UK, where has 100 years of feminism led to? It's led to a lot of unintended consequences. So today, women receive preferential treatment in the criminal justice system with lighter sentences, preferential domestic violence support and cancer research, despite statistics showing that men are often vulnerable at similar or higher rates. It's led to education gaps with women excelling ahead of men at universities and in entry to employment. It's led to women being liable to pay alimony to ex-husbands in the event of divorce. And the individualistic denial of mutual legal rights and duties between men and women in marriage has led to a frustration and isolation for both genders. And it's led to rising divorce rates. Women are socially and economically compelled to work. It's not out of choice and often socially compelled by the fashion industry and the media to dress in revealing clothing and sexualize their appearance in order to be validated by society. Men can sleep with women without any legal commitment and so many are now turning away from marriage and women have to provide for themselves. So if anything, it could be argued that men might be happier here in the West than they would be in these so-called patriarchal Muslim countries. Domestic violence also continues to exist in shocking proportions, including against men and including amongst lesbian couples as well. And men and women both continue to be judged according to their gender rather than their merit. So is this what Muslim feminists are proposing or advocating for the Muslim world? Now, going back to the text, we encounter the fundamental problem with feminist interpretation. If we point to the Quran or Hadith as evidence for why Islam and feminism conflict. Many feminists will simply reply, those texts are metaphorical, they're not to be understood literally, or the texts are historical, they're, not for, they're only for that time, they're not for this time. Despite those verses being mubin, which means clear or unambiguous. Now seeing as the Quran and Hadith, which I've talked about this evening, are fundamental to Islam, and seeing how Muslim feminists make excuses for rejecting these texts today or openly admitting to saying no to them, simple common sense would dictate that Islam and feminism are conflicting. But seeing how Muslim feminists seem to remain unfazed by this, I propose that we need a falsification test for this topic. And that is that if feminists don't consider the Quran and Hadith conflicting with Islam to mean that Islam con uh, uh, conflicting with feminism, sorry, to mean that Islam conflicts with feminism, then what would be sufficient evidence to show that Islam and feminism are conflicting? If it's not the Quran and Hadith, what else is there left to show conflict? What evidence would they accept without making these excuses? Now, I invite you all this evening to think about what conflict would look like and other than overly wishful thinking, have we not already witnessed this conflict between Islam and feminism? Thank you for your time. Um, I'm, going to pull, uh, I'm going to post questions from our four uh, subtopic, which is Islamic feminism, Quran and Hadith, polygamy, and hijab. I'm going to uh, pose each uh, panel with one question um, on the same topic, but not the same question. Uh, and the order to answer the question is according to uh, the order of me posing the question. So, on Islamic feminism, I'll start with Zara. If Islam is all encompassing and just to women and men, why are all the prophets, most imam, clerics, judges, 
as well as you see in practices, for example, legal structure. Four, four women are equal to one man as a witness. You know, these evidence are very much male-centric. And does this not show that female are subjugated in Islam? So I guess um, this question is something that we hear frequently. Why do you need, for example, uh, four male, witness, uh, four male witnesses um, uh, who, who attest to certain things? Or two, yeah, four, you know, equals, well, this is coming to my next point, actually. Why do you need two female witnesses to equal one male witness? Now, if you are familiar with a lot of the rulings in Islam, you'll know that there are situations in which you need four male witnesses to equal one female witness. For example, in accusations of, of zina or fornication, if you have someone accusing the woman, they need four male witnesses to equal that one woman's uh, testimony. So there are many scenarios in which the, you know, it depends on the circumstance, it depends on the situation. In matters, for example, of childbirth or things which women at the time tended to be more familiar with, you didn't need two female witnesses. It was just sort of, you know, one female witness and sometimes you might even need two male witnesses. With regards to when you did need two female witnesses, this was purely in relation to commercial transactions. So the verse where you'll find this is purely in relation to commercial transactions. So it says to the people, when you are engaging in a transaction, be sure to write it down. That's the first thing. This is giving kind of the, the, you know, the completion uh, requirements for, for doing any kind of contract. And because women at the time were not as involved in commercial and transactional affairs, it said you know, to have two female witnesses if you can't find two men, so you have one, female, one male and two women. Now, I think the problem that people encounter um, when they hear about, oh, why do you need two uh, women to equal one man? There's a lot of misconceptions about Islam's opinion on uh, women's intellectual capacity or what Islam says about women's intellectual capacity. Now, in Islam, a woman can be in any position of, of authority. There's only one that you can't be in, and that's the role of the caliph, for example. I'll explain what I mean, if, if you'll allow. Um, so, a woman in Islam can be a judge, she can be an advisor to a ruler, she can be a teacher, she can be in any role. And there are plentitude of examples from, uh, from, our, from the prophetic tradition and ever since then. Um, you had an advisor to the caliph, who the, you know, the, the caliph very much valued her opinion. And you had um, the woman who was the, uh, in authority of the marketplace, so she was basically the regulator of the market, a very public arena, yet she was a woman, she was valued for her intellect, and you know, women were not held back from these roles, and it also wasn't considered something special, that, oh, a woman is doing this role. It was taken as a given. Why wouldn't she do this role? It wasn't uh, glamorized. It was kind of socialized norm at the time. Now, the only reason that, uh, for example, the woman can't be in the role of the caliph is a very sort of, it's a practical reason. The first is that the, role, the ruler is essentially not anyone special. It doesn't matter who the ruler is. The system is agreed upon by the people. The ruler is there purely to administer the role. So this idea that somehow putting a woman in the position will change the way things work, doesn't really translate. For example, in Pakistan, where you didn't even have an Islamic system, you had, um, you know, you had Muslims, and it's very much a secular country. But having, you know, a female ruler didn't improve conditions for women at all. Uh, similarly, in other countries, having a female ruler alone does not improve the conditions. What matters is the governance and the uh, the system that is agreed upon and the ruler is purely the administrator so the first thing is we shouldn't be obsessed with oh why can't women be rulers because it's irrelevant if you agree on what needs to be done it doesn't really matter and secondly the role of the caliph as a male is purely because as the male they would also be the commander of sort of the army and be expected to go into battle and so because women are not legally obliged to be conscripted in Islam you're not legally legally obliged to fight Although you could do so voluntarily if you were in a Muslim country and they had an army. However, because it's not an obligation on you, the state can't also call on you to be a leader. So it's purely an exemption rather than a restriction. However, as I mentioned, because the woman can be in a capacity of an, uh, the capacity of an advisor, and because the, the, who the person, who the ruler is, doesn't really matter, it's, it's a non-issue. It's, it's been generally a non-issue for Muslims. But we don't see that translated in a very dominated uh, Muslim society, whereas women are in position. No, you don't need to let the men lead. 
and yeah. then it's so ingrained mm -hmm. that it affects a lot. Yeah. The 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 great the, the sorry the public. Yeah. So and yeah, that concerns so, a lot of people. So what do you have to say? So the sisters bringing up um, very. Uh, acute and uh, correct observation that in the Muslim world today, this is not what we see. And this is correct, this is not what we see. So you know how I mentioned in my presentation about how the Muslim world today is essentially a post-colonial mess. It is really a mess. And this is not how Islam is supposed to be practiced. There is interest banking, there is corruption, there is lying, there is, you know, people struggling. Their only currency is, is um, so-called honor and reputation. It's become very tribal, it's become very unlearned. It is not attached to the classical traditions anymore. It's come very far from that. And I think we shouldn't look to the Muslim world as an example for how Islam should be. We should look at Islam and its historical practice, its successful practice in the past, for how to re-implement this. And in the Muslim countries, in the Muslim world, that is what needs to be revived. The classical understandings, reconnecting people in a lively and dynamic way to the classical scholarship and making sure that the governance and all the infrastructure is put in place properly so that those things can be uh, seen through, so that people's rights and duties can be protected and so that you are not having people being exploited for, you know, you owe me this duty, do this, while, you know, everything else is, you know, going to, going to hell, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. So, for example, um, how did the Arab Spring start in the Muslim world? It was a man who was so frustrated with the political and economic condition and circumstance, he was so frustrated, one of hundreds of thousands, because he couldn't provide for his family with honor and dignity. He was just trying to make a living and provide for you know, his wife and children and family. He was so frustrated at the tyranny and corruption that he set himself on fire. Now, we didn't say this is a men's rights issue. We didn't say this is um, a family issue. We recognize that this is anarchy in the Muslim world. There is tyranny and there is corruption. So we can't look at the Muslim world and isolate problems and look at them individually. We have to look at the bigger picture um, in order to provide a holistic solution and make sure that the, the groundwork is there rather than the piecemeal implementation of one or two, you know, one or two implementations. It doesn't really work like that. I'll get back to you with Marina. Um, so my question on Islamic family, um, this um, embracing feminism means we have to assess the entire um, Islamic jurisprudence are, in other words, also fit the practices conventions. Do you think if we adhere to feminism, Islamic feminism, per se, we need to change some means of practicing Islam? Well, no, I don't think so because I think um, Islam by itself there is there is no problem. And by the way, it's it's, it's very interesting. But I agree with everything that Zara has just said <laughs> <laughs> because it's absolutely true that. Um, you know, the, it shouldn't be an issue who is there and all that. But there is the, uh, who is the leader, or who is the teacher or whoever, it shouldn't be an issue. But, the, but there is this thing called unconscious bias, I think I've heard of it, where people are so ingrained into thinking that only certain people can do, be certain things. And we've just had an interesting, I don't know whether you all follow Malaysian news, but we just had this interesting thing where a couple of years ago, uh, the Malaysian National Fatwa Council said that women could be Sharia judges. Mm -hmm. Now, this is partly um, a practical, uh, uh, what do you call it? Practical thing, because as you know, there are more uh, female students uh, in our universities than there are there are male. There are seventy percent now, and that includes uh, in Islamic studies. So there are actually more women coming out, you know, graduating from Islamic studies, uh, then they are men. So naturally they are going to go into, uh, you know, the religious departments and all that, and they are going to go up the ranks. And after a while, the most qualified people to be judges are the women. So uh, the National uh, Fatwa Council said, yeah, it's, it's fine, you know, uh, for, for them to be judges. And um, so a couple of years ago, uh, they appointed the first two women, uh, uh, Sharia judges. And they announced, we've just appointed them. The men all freaked out. <laughs> because like, they didn't realize that it was happening, I think. And then they immediately said, oh, okay, they can be judges, but they can't be uh, judges in the divorce 
in divorce cases because they might be buyers. <laughs> um, why? We, we don't know, you know, but, but it was a kind of too late already because they were already appointed, they had the letters of appointment and all that. So anyway, so that's, uh, that was okay. Uh, they, they, and then since then there have been more uh, uh, judges. But recently, a couple of days ago actually, the head of the National Fatwa Council uh, commented that some states are still refusing to appoint uh, women as Sharia court judges. Um, and he wanted to know why, because they are very uh, qualified, they are higher, uh, what do you call it, CPGA? Uh, uh, you know, they are very American, right? American style, I don't understand. But anyway, better than, better than the, the, the guys, and so why can't they uh, appoint uh, these women as uh, Sharia court judges? So today, uh, he particularly pointed out Slango, uh, Slango State, uh, which is a Jais, you know, a Ma'is, uh, very problematic uh, state. Um, I'll go into that later. <laughs> um, but today, uh, Ma'is, uh, the head of Ma'is, Majlis Agama Islam Slango, came out and said, yeah, 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 we'll appoint them, but only in family matters and things like that, and not in the criminal uh, it's a Sharia criminal under the Sharia Criminal Offences Act. Uh, fine, you know, fine. At least they considered that much. It was better than from zero. So, you know, there is that bias where they it, it's not necessarily Islamic, as we pointed out. There's no real reason uh, to not have uh, these women because they are qualified, but. Yet they didn't want to uh, appoint them until now. They're being pushed by a man, by the way, not any of us. Uh, so you know now, now they've been pushed into a position where they have to appoint uh, women Sharia court judges, and you get a lot of these cases all over the time. Not and sometimes not even just from uh, men, but also from women. Like we had um, this Adun. Uh, State Assemblywoman from Para, who said that women could not be uh, Besar or Chief Minister of the state because uh, there are a lot of uh, religious functions that she has to perform with the Sultan, and she couldn't do that because she's a woman. Now, in the job description of being Chief Minister of the state, I'm not sure that religious functions with the Sultan is number one. I'm sure it's about administering the, the state properly, making sure it's developed, uh, and, and ensuring that you know, you know, the well-being of people in the state, etc., etc., which is pretty much gender neutral. You know, it, it is, you, you, you know, as you said, it's about governance, right? It's whether you're going to be a good governor or not. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, but there's this woman saying that um, you couldn't just because you can't perform the this religious duties which take up maybe you know five percent of your time as MB. So you know it, it's things like this, you know, where does this come from? Where does this type of thinking come from? Is it Islamic? In fact I'm, I have a tendency to agree with Zara that actually it comes from a, a colonial past that we haven't quite shaken off uh, because you know a lot of our laws in Malaysia um, uh, the codified uh, religious laws actually came from the Brits the Brits came and codified our laws before that actually women in in the Malay Peninsula because of course when they came over a hundred something years ago it was not Malaysia yet women had a lot of rights they could go and complain to the village head if they had a problem with their husband, their own property, etc. etc. Then the Brits came, and as Brits do, they, what they like to do, they like to codify laws. Anyway, they like to write it all down. Right? So they decided that, okay, all these customary laws that are out there, we have to put it down. We have to write it down. Now, when they wrote it down, don't forget, this was in Victorian times. Um, some of the things that when they tried to codify it, they, they, they brought in their own 
beliefs and biases and all that into it. Uh, how many of you watch Downton Abbey? Hey, <laughs> 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 guy, <laughs> You all don't watch, ah? Downton Abbey, you know the premise of Downton Abbey, right? Yeah. The premise is that this guy, Lord Brentham, has got all these doctors who they own, they, they own this wonderful mansion, right? This beautiful mansion. It's very important who this daughters marry, right? Because in Victorian times, when a woman marries, her property goes to the husband. Right? So, in in our country, in Malaysia, that was not the case. But these the colonial uh, officers who were codifying our laws couldn't believe this. Like how can a woman administer her own property? So it must go to the husband. So they couldn't, couldn't quite believe this. And today, you know, one of the things that a lot, all of us Muslim women grow up with is that if our, whatever our fathers give us, whatever our family gives us, you know, our property, when we get married, it's still ours, right? So that has been in our uh, family laws for the longest time. It, up to 1984, we had the best family laws in the world. And that was one of the things that, that was pretty much central, you know, for, for Muslim women, that we own our own properties. But now it, it has been changed in the name of gender neutrality so that now if uh, a Muslim couple gets divorced in Malaysia that property that you bring to the marriage which should remain yours it's counted as hunter uh, which is in English. matrimonial property <laughs> <laughs> but you can guess <laughs> matrimonial property and then you you split up, you have to divide it by half. So what you bring, so this was the Lord Grantham problem, right? Uh, suddenly, you have it, you have it there. Uh, and this is not, you know, you know, and this is a problem because it's, it's, um, it comes from a bias that, that translates into law and public policy. And then that's a big problem for a lot of women now in Malaysia. I mean, we can talk about the, the theoretical. The theory is great. You know, the theory is great. Muslim women, when Islam came, they're entitled to have their own property. But now suddenly, they have to give it up because of these laws that are written down. So, you know, I blame the Brits. <laughs> but the thing is that there are some people now defending this type of laws and saying Islamic, we cannot change. But in the fact is that it's been changed several times. Uh, 1984, we really had great, uh, great uh, Muslim family laws in Malaysia. I can't speak for other countries, but it has been changed over time so that we uh, Muslim women actually have lost a lot of it. And the trouble is, we live in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country, and we have a constitution that is supposed to apply to every citizen in Malaysia. But the fact is that for no Muslim women, they have been gaining rights uh, over these years, but we have been losing. And that is, you know, doesn't gel to me. If you're, you're equal under this constitution, but you have different rights, and, and we are losing these this rights, um, it, you know, it, it is not, it's actually, I think, Anisami. <laughs> you know, what, what else can I say? Because the, there is no justice uh, for Muslim women. And I can tell you so many stories from our experiences of the women that come to us uh, who are really suffering. It's, it's, you know, when it translates into law and public policy, when it's implemented, then human uh, biases and beliefs and all that come into play. And how it plays out in real life is causes a lot of unhappiness, causes a lot of injustice, uh, etc. Okay. Could I add to this yeah. something? So I'm I'm glad that you agree that you know the inheritance laws should um, you know the Islamic inheritance law is kind of better. But I guess what concerns me is I was looking, for example, at the, um, maybe you could comment, if you want, you don't have to comment, but um, I was looking at, for example, the, the Mosawa, which is one of the organizations to, you know, cultivate sort of feminism and stuff. 
I was looking at the toolkit and the framework that they, they have on the website and some of the aims said, you know, um, equal, equal rights, including like gender egalitarianism, including equal division of property and they should have the same property rights as one another. And I found that a bit, a, a bit alarming compared with what, what you've explained today because what does that mean? Does that mean where in Islam women get, you know, they get to keep all their property but they only get half inheritance? Would equalizing it, are, are those individuals calling then that men should also get to keep all of their property and not have to provide? Or are they saying that, you know, women have to be the providers? Or are they saying that, you know, both parties get to keep their own, their own property and not provide for each other? So this kind of thing I think is problematic and concerning. So if these are the kinds of, of proposals and values being put out there, I don't see how this will help some of the problems that you've, that you've just mentioned. So I agree that you know, a lot of these um, the, the laws and the attitudes are from a Victorian era, sort of transported over, um, you know, thinking that the whole world needs this when it really doesn't. It did similar things in Malaysia, preventing women, for example, from uh, you know, becoming doctors, whereas they used to before, whereas the, you know, the colonial um, you know, guys would come along and say, you know, our women make do with male doctors, you can do the same. It's been the same throughout the Muslim world. So I think the response to this shouldn't be, let's, you know, for example, with regards to property and inheritance, I don't think it should be as some, what some of these organizations are, you know, honestly saying, which is that it should be divided and equal property rights for, for both, because that's exactly what the, the, you know, has been the cause of some of these problems in the first place. So, I don't know, that, that's kind of, you know, I find it a bit striking that the comparison between what you've said, which is nice, but what, for example, some of the, the, um, the policies and uh, aims of the organizations uh, differ quite a bit. Actually, they don't differ. Um, it's what, you know, women have these rights, women have the right, selectively gender neutral. Mm -hmm. What it means is that what was the rights of women have been given to the men, uh, what the men's rights have not been given to the women. If we were happy with status quo mm. before, uh, but now what happens is, for in, for instance, before the say uh, if a man wanted to, according to our laws, again I can't speak for other countries. Say if a man wanted to take another wife, he had to um, explain to the court uh, why he wanted to. He also had to uh, prove to the court that the current wife's um, standard of living, family and all that would not um, uh, deteriorate uh, if he took another wife uh, and all that. But all this has been amended so that now um, the, the, he has no obligation to make sure that the first family is cared for and, and all that plus he is now allowed to um, take the the property of the first wife and use it even to provide for the, for the next wife and we've had cases where the man uh, actually froze the account of his first wife and left her with nothing uh, just because he wanted to take another wife so we have all these uh, different things happening and, and also if you I'm sure you know that in Malaysia every state has its own uh, religious laws so in every fact state. every state because it's a state uh, responsibility not a federal one so in fact we have 13 different variations uh, of uh, all these laws so um, so the thing is you know there, there are all sorts of things and when you talk about property Hmm. Uh, actually, what do you mean by property? You know, it's um, we talk about assets, right? Um, land or things like that in terms of property. But what has happened in Malaysia again is that they have extended the all this uh, the Islamic way of dividing property, uh, or they this extended the definition of property to things like EPF. To things like insurance. So if a man buys uh, insurance, life insurance, and names, I mean Muslim man, names uh, his wife as beneficiary, which is what the intention is, 
remind you so that you make sure that after uh, he passes away, the, the wife has something, you know, to to um, to have something after. That is now subjected to Farai. So insurance. <laughs> EPF also. EPF you're supposed to uh, put down beneficiary. You cannot put down uh, your wife as the uh, you get beneficiary. The wife and daughters can only be uh, I forget the word. Something like trustees. <coughs> you know, so they, they don't actually, they can't actually get it. They can only that it has to be divided uh, by far. And we've had lots of cases where male relatives, um, brothers, uncles, or whatever of the deceased have swooped in and taken it away. Uh, even property. We had uh, this woman who uh, husband died, and his brothers came and took over the house, the house that she had lived in all her married life. Uh, and kicked her out of it because they had they uh, they had the right to take it and uh, and she was left uh, homeless. So these type of cases um, are, are the things that you know worries a lot of women. And and when it is justified in the name of Islam, it's very worrying because it's fatally unjust. Mm -hmm. And how could how could you know? Throwing people out onto the street be considered Islamic, uh, and that's the that's the the real life problems that we have to deal with. Um, Just uh, very briefly, okay. very, very briefly. Hopefully, people are finding it interesting. <laughs> um, it seems again from some of the issues you described, the solution is to enforce and reinforce that actually the Islamic division of property, not um, equal division or these other sort of um, equal rights sort of language that comes out of, of um, organizations that you know talk about this like Masawa. You're proposing it's misleading. I, I'm proposing it, it, it is misleading because what it sounds like if you say that men and women should have equal property rights you're making it sound like you're not talking about Islamic property rights you're not specifying women should be allowed to keep their property untampered you're not saying that this is what you want to be protected and enforced and you're also opening the floodgates to all kinds of interpretations, which gives rise to some of the problems you mentioned with regards to insurance and these kinds of um, uh, non-physical type, intangible types of wealth, these issues. And the other thing is, obviously, nobody should be thrown out of their home. Obviously. Um, Islamically, for example, uh, you know, in an Islamic uh, governance or Islamic state, it's actually the responsibility of, uh, you know, of the government to make sure that there is no one in that position where they would have to kind of be exposed to the elements and have to, you know, be on the streets. So, if Islamically a woman no longer has, um, you know, a, a, what is known as a wali amr or a guardian or someone who is administratively responsible for where she lives then the state steps into that role and should be protecting her. So where you have in Muslim countries women being thrown out or women facing these problems, again, these are not from Islam. These are problems of structure, problems of governance. And I think that organizations uh, should be advocating um, purely uh, the Islamic um, uh, injunctions in terms of property rights, in terms of marital rights, rather than calling on, because it sounds nice to some people, you know, these words, uh, equality and egalitarianism, without actually explaining what they mean, mm -hmm. without actually explaining what is meant when using them. So I think this is one of the, you know, one of the causes of the problems, and by calling for those same values, we are going to exacerbate the problems. Okay. Well, actually, I think we, have, we are responding to these problems. I mean, it wasn't because we were calling for equal rights that... Uh, they had this fatwa for EPF or for insurance. It happened, you know, uh, because without, it, it just happened. Somebody somewhere decided that this was done. So, um, you know, we are responding to very real problems that women have. I think, yes, I agree with you. Uh, the state should come down hard on people who throw women out of their homes and throw families out of their homes, etc. But the thing is, they don't. So if they don't, who is going to take up this problem? Us, you know, we have to fight for these uh, rights. You can, you know, and 
we are pointing out that it is an Islamic to throw people out of uh, sorry, their homes. But I think I need to proceed with other questions. I'm so sorry. Um, so you spoke about interpretation. So crime hadith is the big issue here. Do you think um, Muslim women should have political power to say that the other version of the interpretation is right? So the question for anyone that didn't catch it is um, should women have the political power to say that their interpretation um, is correct, you know, compared with others. Now, I think the first of all, there's two things which should not be relevant. The first is the gender of the person, and the second is political power. Uh, the purpose of interpreting Quran is to understand what was what was God's will, to understand the intention of God in, in how we're supposed to be, you know, living our lives. Now, what that means is you have to be first of all, um, if you are trying to interpret. Um, what that means, you should be a qualified mujtahid. And it's irrelevant what your gender is, um, but what is relevant is if you are biased, if you have a political agenda, if you have a certain uh, angle or skew, that could mean that you might read into it things which are not there, um, then that makes someone questionable. And I don't think it's about you know whether it's male or female, whether they should have the political power or not. I think uh, we need to revive scholarship generally. So we have a decline in scholarship generally throughout the Muslim world. I think it's irrelevant whether we have more female scholars or male scholars. If they are true to the goal of interpreting and understanding what God's will was, and not bringing into it other, um, trying to read into it, like I mentioned in my presentation, and trying to marry it up with other ideologies, which kind of defeats the purpose, then there is no problem with a woman being um, a mujtahid or, 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 or this kind of thing. Um, and again, we have to be cautious uh, of, I guess, when we say, oh, women have the political power to, to interpret or, or to pose their interpretation as correct, um, it shouldn't be that they have to be in a political position. So there are you know, some uh, uh, narrations and, and instructions that if the scholar is at the, the foot or at the step of the ruler, they're probably, you know, they're not really to be trusted because if you have political goals and a political uh, agenda, then you're not going to be objective in your work. Um, and one of the, you know, problems in the Muslim world today, scholarship is in massive decline. So if you imagine, um, just to make this a little bit more um, close uh, to, to anybody that doesn't have familiarity with a Muslim country or has not spent time in a Muslim country or have familiarity with the background generally, just imagine if, you know how in England we have hundreds and hundreds of years of, of English law jurisprudence. It's very refined, it's very, you know, uh, complicated, there's, there's legislation, there's case law, uh, you have to understand which case, uh, you know, overrules which case, all this kind of stuff. Now imagine if you had an occupying force come and take over your country and prevent you from studying your legal past and prevent you from continuing that legal past so that all you are left with is the bare basics, the bare rudimentary basics of what your legal system used to be. You can't engage with it in a sophisticated way anymore. And this is essentially what happened as a result of post-colonialism in the Muslim world. And so these days, scholars are very much um, imitating past things that they used to do, whereas sometimes, you know, the method of, of that is, is no, the style of uh, having those rulings today, you know, the way you implement them may no longer sort of work. You may have to change the style of implementation. Not what the ruling actually says, but the style of it itself. And when people are so distant from the classical scholarship and understanding why and having the infrastructure in place. This is what leads to some of the problems and leads to people thinking that they need to be in positions of political power to force a certain interpretation. And I think this is a, a dangerous path to go down to mix um, political power with you know, uh, you know, particular interpretations. Rather, we need a sincere revival, a sincere revival um, of Islam in the Muslim world not looking at the gender of the scholars, um, not looking uh, through at things through uh, gender-biased lenses, so not looking at things through sort of, in Arabic we use the word asabiyya, which means like tribalism or nationalism, or basically um, an arbitrary feeling of, 
oh, this person is the same gender as me, so we are together. No, this is irrelevant. It is irrelevant. We should agree upon um, Islamic conceptions of justice and the actual, uh, you know, revival of that and how to bring that about. That is more important than these kinds of identity politics and this kind of thing. Um, so I think I'll just, because we're running out of time, so I think I'm need to rush it a bit. Um, I, do, I just want to say that I, I agree so much with what Sarah has said. Yes, um, you know, this sort of political agenda with a lot of, I agree that we need um, more scholarship that is seriously lacking uh, in Muslim countries, even at the most basic level, actually. It's, it's really sad. Uh, so we need a lot more of that, and also the the conflation of a lot of religion with politics these days, with political agendas, has really uh, caused a lot of disruption in many of our countries. In, in Malaysia, is I can I can give you numerous examples. I know Malaysian students here all know. Uh, so it's kind of um, it, it's I totally agree with you. We need some sort of Clear revival to you know get back to the basics. You know, yeah. um, okay, I think I need to ask questions on polygamy as well. Very two very controversial women you know, with respect to female. Um, do you think polygamy devalues women? That's like for polygamy and for hijab. Um, hijab meaning headscarf or mm. head covering uh, was firstly done by a prophet's wife. What argument, I mean, within context of Islam, what argument do we have to extend this to the legal public? Okay, do you want me to go first? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I guess I'll start with the hijab one because it's very, I think it's very straightforward. So, this is sort of saying that, you know, the verses were originally directed at the wives of the Prophet. So, what explanation do we have for rolling this out to, to, to everyone? Um, and I think it's very simple, so the, the Quran actually states itself, tell the believing women um, to, you know, to cover in a certain way so that they may be recognized and not, not molested. So it's addressing, in that verse, it's addressing uh, all, um, all believing or Muslim women. So it's not restricting it to the wives of the Prophet. And uh, the verses that it uses are, for example, uh, sorry, the specific term that it uses for the covering is often, a, uh, you know, a subject of discussion for many people. So uh, it uses the term uh, khimar in one verse, which means at the time they would wear the khimar, which is the head cover. Um, however, they would not have it coming down, they would have it going back behind their shoulders. Um, so basically would expose the, you know, the front of, of, of them. And so the verse says to tell them to bring their khimars and also basically cover uh, the chest area. So this verse describes not just general, you know, some people say, oh, it just refers to general covering. There was no clear outline of, I mean, most people argue there was no clear outline of what is our and what's not our. Right, so if we, yeah, exactly so, but if you look at the precise word, it tells you, and people at the time would wear the head cover, so you would take it on that basis that seeing as they were wearing that, it extends to, you know, further beyond that. And also there are numerous um, narrations uh, or ahadith or prophetic traditions which describe it further. So, for example, the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, instructed that, you know, uh, the only thing that should be seen is the face and the hands. So, you know, uh, implying that the head uh, also, you know, should be covered. Um, so I think that one's, that one's pretty, you know, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. With regards to polygamy and whether it um, sort of um, uh, devalues, is that the word? Yeah. yeah, devalues women. Now, I do want to point out that for many, many people, uh, polygamy is consensual. For many people. Some people prefer it. Some people find that it works for them. In some societies, it is more common and they find that it works for them. In other societies, it is not, and so they tend not to do it. Now. Islamically, you are allowed, when you get married, to stipulate in your contract whether you're going to put up with that or not. So if the guy says, I'm going to, you know, at some point, take a second wife, she can point to the contract and say, well, if you are, this is what's going to happen. Now, Islam gives you that choice. It gives you that, you know, that, that, that room to specify that. Um, and that is, that is your prerogative. If it is consensual, then there is no... There, there should be no objection to it. There should be no rancor towards it. If someone wants to do that voluntarily, good for them. <coughs> it's interesting because um, a recent Gallup poll in America found that um, increasingly, 
uh, Americans are, are thinking that polygamy is not such a bad thing. And they're saying that they prefer the idea of polygamy to the idea of an unfaithful person in a monogamous marriage. So they prefer the idea of polygamy to obviously being cheated on. Um, now again, it's, it's up to people what they want to opt in for and what they prefer. And it's just like, uh, because polygamy was sent down to a culture where Arabic culture back then, they were so polygamous, that's more than, more than four wives mm. or four husbands at a time. Um, and then Islam came, narrowed to down, to right. restrict the form. Mm. But now you see most people are monogamous, but then it seems being used to counter. The other way. The other way. Well, I think to be honest, there's any number of reasons why someone might want to think it's a, you know, might think it's a good idea to, if they want to take a second wife and the first wife is okay with it, the Quran allows it. So it's not for, for me or, or anybody to sit here and say you are not allowed to do it, you know, provided that they, uh, according to the verse, treat them equally if they can, you know, and if they're happy with that arrangement, you know, that's fine. Um, so if the Quran permits it, you know, for whatever reason, it's not. For us to say you should not be doing this if they fulfill the, the requisite you know the requisite conditions so whilst it came to restrict the number of, of uh, wives that people had at the time of the Prophet peace be upon him you know there could be any number of reasons you might want to take a second wife because you just would like to you might because there is a social benefit in that you might for any number of reasons so I think sometimes when we look at these provisions um, we can dehumanize them when we analyze them and we can say how can a man take so many wives like this is abhorrent this is unacceptable but we forget that people are human beings and you know the complexities of life are immense you can have you know there's all sorts of reasons why someone might do that um, you know provided it's consensual I don't think anybody should have a problem with it it's interesting because um, in uh, I was reading the other day how even um, there are some same gender couples known as thruples because there's three of them um, and there was yeah there's uh, one um, uh, lesbian thruple in um, in, the, in Massachusetts and one um, gay thruple in Thailand and they didn't uh, they basically got a lawyer to write down all the things that would happen in an Islamic contract because obviously the law is not flexible for them at the mm -hmm. time but basically to mimic a marriage now, it seems that sometimes people are okay with polygamy, but when Muslims do it, it's like a big, you know, oh, how could you so barbaric and, you know, so careless and thoughtless. Whereas, you know, I think we should, um, we should realize that what Islam has permitted um, for, for men and women, um, polygamous, you know, if man wants to take more than whatever, you know, one wife up to four, if it's consensual, and if it's, the, it's not my preference, it's not some other people's preference, it's irrelevant. If it's their preference, Islam permits it. That's the end of the story as far as I'm concerned. Do you have anything to add on? Yeah, um, I completely agree. Uh, in the Quran, it allows uh, polygamy um, as long as you can treat, uh, well, the man can treat all his wives equally, fairly. How do, we, how do we know whether it's fair or not? Well, this is the thing. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the theory of it is, is great and it's always consensual because, you know, they, it's usually suka sama suka, uh, mutual liking and therefore you get married. But how does it actually translate into real life? Um, my organization, SIS, we did a study on uh, the impact of polygamy on families uh, in Malaysia. So we interviewed more than a thousand respondents, husbands, first wife, second wife. Uh, children of first wife, children of second wife. And it, it's turned out to be very interesting because the, the principles of, you know, fairness and all that were simply not there in real life. Um, it might be uh, the first wife, of course, married, uh, cons mutual consent, of course, with the husband. He married the second wife, also mutual consent. But the first wife didn't approve. Mm -hmm. So she didn't know about it. You know, we had we had laws, like I said, in 1984. Uh, we had really very good uh, laws uh, about this, which protected the women. So like the man couldn't marry another one without the signed consent of the first wife. So she always knows about it, and she has to consent. So her 
consent is needed, the, the second wife's consent is needed. Over the years, it got amended that he uh, no longer needed the, the consent for that. I mean, well, who knows? Because these laws are made not with a lot of discussion or consultation with people, but you know, very quietly uh, done. Uh, that's why in 19, um, 2005, when they were amending the, the uh, Muslim family laws, which would have even reduced the, the protection of women uh, in these laws, we, we kicked up a stink. Um, and, and the government said must pass it, but they won't gazette it, which means it doesn't become law, pending further consultations with all interested parties, all that, which they have done, but they have not uh, tabled it back to parliament. And just as an example, you know, before, the, um, all these uh, marriages had to be in front of a judge and the, the, um, the second marriages or third marriages, whatever. The, and the man had to prove that it was just and necessary. Yeah, just meaning just to the, the existing wife and family and necessary to have this uh, other wife. They amended just one little word which was they changed the word and to all. And so now, he just has to prove it's necessary. Takut uh, Telanju is very uh, afraid of overstepping the bounds, meaning that he felt himself at risk of uh, zina, you know. So that was the name. But whether it was just to the first wife all became irrelevant. Um, and so, you know, this type of of things were happening. And in our study, we, we found that, you know, um, fairness to all the wives means providing equally to all the wives. What we found was that the very often the first wives felt that they, they suffered a loss in living standards uh, because the man's income is the same. And he now has to divide it into two families, right? And so the first wife is forced to go out and work uh, to sell kue or restaurant, and sometimes we found that actually um, they, the man was hardly working because all his wives were working and supporting their own families and supporting him. We found one man who had four wives, 22 children, and his salary was 2,200 ringgit. Uh, divide by six. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you can't live here, uh, you know, you can't live, even in Malaysia, you can't live on that. <laughs> and that salary. So the wives uh, all had to go out and work in order to survive, right? And this is really a complete, uh, I think, distortion of what it was meant to be, what is in the Quran and all that, and yet uh, they carry on. So these are the sort of things that we point out because we get a lot of women coming to us uh, complaining, about complaining about these things, you know, that, you know, why suddenly, you know, um, my life has gone completely upside down because he, he wants to have another wife or and another and another um, and each time their living standards uh, uh, went down. One of the things that we did with this study which hasn't been done before was that we talked to the children the of children. the first and the second, uh, the children of the first one and the second wife and because we could only interview people who are adults, 18 and above, some of them were quite old already, had married and had children, they were like 40, over 50 years old. But the pain they carried throughout their lives was still there. The emotional, the emotional pain that they felt. Um, that There was a, a girl who, who said that when she went to meet her father to ask for money for her education, he said, and you are from which mother again? So he didn't know, uh, even his own children. Surely, this is not what is intended to do, right? The family is is the basic unit of society. It be, you know, it's supposed to be harmonious and happy and all that. But if this causes, in real life, 
this causes so much pain and hurt and, and injustice, surely that, you know, we're not saying eradicating it, but surely we should put in the type of protections for women that, and children that prevents this uh, from happening. And, and, and you know, despite, you know, just one more thing, despite the, uh, that the fact is allowed, a lot of men hide the fact that they have other wives. And unfortunately for first wives and children, they often discover this upon his death. We've had so many cases of suddenly at the funeral, his whole other family turns up. <laughs> and and, and the, the, the worst thing is that some of the kids are already quite grown up, which means he's hidden it for so long. And you know, the anguish and the pain and things that, that comes at an already sad time, and then the fights over inheritance and all that, uh, it's, it's really, you know. So I think what we are, we are trying to say is that, yes, it's allowed, yes, there are good reasons for it, but when there is abuse of it, and, and it really is abuse, you know, um, then we have to do something because, you know, it does not protect the dignity of the family or the dignity of the woman, etc. Okay, um, I would just so add to it. Very can, important. Can I, think. I open the, yeah. the question to the public? Yeah, yeah. and then I'll, I'll just comment on yeah. it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I just think it's really important to, um, to realise that all of these problems that, um, you know, uh, Marina talked about, just to point out that they're not because of polygamy itself. Mm -hmm. They are because of the lack of infrastructure, the lack of ability for maybe Muslim women to go to courts and say, my husband is neglecting. He's neglecting, you know? If your suddenly your standard of living drops because he's taken a second